Every step I take, I move my truth. Every time they tell me stop, I use. Every comment, hate that makes my feel. Gather up my energy and boom. I hear them talking, saying the way that I move is so reckless. That is a part of my mind I've been blessed with. Giving my blood so I am relentless. All right, welcome to the Keep Hammering Collective. I'm here with Max Terriot. How you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm excited to be here, you know? Yeah, Let's man. This, this is awesome that you made time. I know you're busy. Maybe not as busy because you guys are striking, right? We're we're on a big strike right now. So this is uh this is the most downtime I've had, I think, since the start of COVID. Um yeah, it's it's uh it's been different, you know. I've been kind of running hard for the last two years straight mm-hmm. and it's nice to get a little family time and a little time to get outside a little bit, have a little bit of a fall for once. Um and then I get to come and do fun stuff like this that normally I'm I'm missing out on. Oh man, I I really appreciate you coming down, lift run shoot. It's been we've had so much fun. And you gave me a sweet Fire Country Challenge coin. Thank you for that. Of course. It's pretty of course. badass. I one thing that I realized quickly once I put up a couple pictures of us is man, you got a big fan base. People are invested in your characters. You <laughs> yeah. know, for I think everybody knows, but you're an actor. And you know how people latch on to TV and movie personalities or actors or their favorite people and, and you got a bunch of them. Yeah, I think you know, the cool thing about about TV and film is uh you know, I think if it's done right and it, it can really be an escape for people. It can really be a way for people to to just sit down, relax, shut out, you know, their everyday life and 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 just become invested in the show and characters and storylines and and actually just be entertained, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what it's all about. It's all about entertainment. It is, but I, on one hand, I see the characters you play, and I don't want to really say un- Ung Sun sung heroes because in our military we should appreciate them every day but you've played characters um you're on seal teams then you're talking about you know fighting fire those guys don't get a ton of attention mm-hmm. you know and even even soldiers in the grand scheme of things compared to saying athlete don't get the the credit they deserve i don't think but so i mean you say it's entertainment but what i see is you playing roles that they're so important to our are protecting our way of life. Yeah. And I mean, so what does that mean to you? It means everything. Honestly, I know, I know, uh, the way that you said it is really kind of the way that I look at it. And I, I, I realize that I have a, a large platform and, you know, I can do a lot of good through it. And for me, one of the most important things is that not only do people like the show and they like the characters, but they take away something. And, you know, I think, uh, I think it's about humanizing these people and also, you know, if there are ways that we can bring attention to certain causes or organizations or struggles that these folks go through, real life struggles, you know, these people are heroes, but they're human Mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, they bleed and they, they have emotions and, you know, a lot of these people have, have struggles that they go through when, when they're done because the stuff that they see and the stuff that they do is not the stuff that, you know, the average person sees every day. Mm -hmm. And these folks are doing it every single day. Right. You know, when you're talking about our our military, our veterans, when you're talking about, you know, first responders, you know, you might drive by a car accident one day and go, man, that looked terrible. Well, these people are going every single day. Yeah. And they're they're looking at at kids and, and, you know, young people and men and women, just everyone, right? And they're looking at at families. They're looking at, at... stuff that is really, really devastating, hard stuff to see and deal with. And they're having to face that and it takes its toll. And so for me, a big part of it is trying to find a way to help those people. What can we do to help their lives and, and bring awareness to some of these things that, that need to be brought up? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's well said. It's like, cause you say that, you know, these people have to deal with it and, you know, we drive by and then it's over, you know, we saw it and people were like, Oh my God, I can't believe I saw this terrible accident. All you did was drive by, mm-hmm. you know, the people that deal with it daily, that has to take its toll. Um, but I was, I was curious, where did that impetus behind fire country start for you? I mean, cause you're, you were the creator or one of the creators of the series. So why? Why were you inclined to do this? 
Uh, I mean, it all kind of started, you know, at the beginning of COVID and, um, I'm always trying to challenge myself, right? At this, I think that's the, the big thing in life is like find ways to push yourself outside of your comfort zone and do something that scares you a little bit and, and, and see it through. And, and for me, you know, I had directed, I had, I had acted for a long time and, you know, writing was something that I'd never done. And, you know, basically being a, a barely a high school graduate, <laughs> um, you know, a lot of folks said that I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was kind of the biggest motivation was people saying, you can't do this. Right. You know, uh, you're an, you're an actor, you can't write. And that just kind of fueled the, uh, the fire. Um, and you know, I, I grew up in Northern California with a lot of friends who, who do this job, who, who work for these departments. And I'd always just kind of been around it and, and, you know, had a lot of respect for what they do. And, um, and it felt very timely, you know, California, uh, and not just California, the whole West coast, honestly, it's, it's everywhere now. It's, it's all, a lot of the States, um, it's Canada, it's Europe, it's, you know, it's Spain. Uh, we're having these massive wildfires and, um, it just felt like the right time to tell these stories. I realized that nobody had told, you know, the stories of these, these inmate firefighters as well. And I think that that kind of also felt timely. Mm -hmm. Um, and for me, it was about also just showing people in a different light, right? It's, you know, normally, normally when we see inmates or cons in a, in a movie or TV show, they're always the bad guy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of these people made mistakes, but it didn't, it, it's not who they are. Right. And showing that people can actually, you know, be rehabilitated through programs like this and actually come out and get a, you know, get a real job and, and have that life that, that they should have. Mm -hmm. Um, it was about just telling those stories, you know, and I think, uh, I, I just started writing. I sat down like every night at midnight, I tell my wife, I was like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to go write for a couple hours and just mm -hmm. kept working, kept working. And, um, you know, was fortunate to have some, some really great partners along the way. And, um, Tony Phelan and Joan Rader, my writing partners in the show are, are, you know, very smart and experienced. And just, you know, I was, I was lucky to have a lot of great people to, that I worked with the Bruckheimer team. Um, and thankfully I had the, the support of CBS and man, uh, here we are. It's crazy. It's crazy to think like, you know, this, this little idea kind of started mm -hmm. out as this, uh, this small seed and it's grown into this show. And I'm just, I'm blessed. I'm super thankful. You know, I'm, I'm thankful people, you know, have enjoyed the show and, you know, but that doesn't mean that we can be complacent. You know, we always got to keep pushing and mm -hmm. making the show better. I believe we can always do better. Right. How I'm curious how the, the tie in, cause I get the firefighting, mm -hmm. the wild on firefighters deserve a lot of credit. How, where'd the tie in to the inmates come for you? So my wife's cousin, uh, is a CEO at a, an inmate fire camp. And so mm -hmm. I, I knew about it and, you know, I, hadn't, I, I hadn't heard of that to be honest. Yeah. You know, I mean, before this, it's a crazy, so it's a, it's a program they started, um, I don't know if it was World War One or World War Two, but you know, we didn't have enough resources here, uh, enough bodies to fight the, the forest fires. And so mm. they started using inmates mm. to go out and fight these forest fires. Um, and they realize, you know, eventually is, uh, is all politics do, you know, at some point they're like, Hey, we, we can't just make prisoners fight our fires. Like, mm -hmm. You know, we gotta, we gotta come up with a way to like get them to want to do it. Right. And so they came up with the two for one program, which was you get two days off of your sentence for every day served on a fire. Mm, okay. Um, you know, and I've heard a lot of incredible stories from people who have been through the camp, um, are actually rehabilitated now. Uh, have changed their life, you know, and for a lot of these people, you know, I've talked to, I've talked to young guys who, you know, were, grew up in gangs, um, you know, really didn't know a different way of life, had never had a job mm -hmm. and went and they started working as firefighters on inmate crews and, and literally I've heard stories of them telling CEOs, you know, thank you. Thank you for, for this. This mm -hmm. is the first job I've ever had. Mm. And just having a purpose and feeling like they were doing something right. was changing that. And for me, like, isn't that what life is like when you have purpose, 
everything makes sense or it's like that's how you, that's why you get up that's why you give your best because it's for this thing so yeah i could see i could see an inmate i mean they're just serving time just getting through the day but yeah you add that purpose factor in it's like changes everything it feels like totally yeah they start all of a sudden seeing that they're having um that what they're doing seeing the outcome mm-hmm. and seeing you know when they get a cruise through in their buggy in a small town that's just been saved and they're seeing people with mm. signs outside that say thank you firefighters oh man they look at that and they realize that's not that's not just those those men and women who are in those other uniforms mm-hmm. like they're talking about us too yeah they're included and it's it's inspiring and for me a big big thing a big big thing for me with this show that i sort of you know set out to do from the beginning we're dealing with a time right now where as a country, we're so divided. Mm -hmm. And I think people are always looking for ways to pull us further apart. Mm -hmm. And this show, you know, we have inmates from all walks of life fighting fire alongside blue collar firefighters, right alongside shoulder to shoulder. It's like one team, one purpose, Mm-hmm. And that's t- to save lives, to save towns, to save property. And so a big thing is really trying to remind people that we're all human. Right. And we can all come together with one purpose and remember that. And that sort of is is my underlying message of the show yeah. is to remind people of that. And I think I think through firefighting, you know, which is a uh, to me, firefighting is a, it's like a, not anti-political, but it doesn't have the same political surrounding. I right. think most people just view firefighters as heroes. Mm-hmm. And so it, for me, it's, it's an easier avenue to use that, right? And to remind people that, hey, look, at here are all these heroes coming together with one goal. Mm-hmm. They might all be different, but that's fine. That's what makes us unique is that we're different. Yeah. That's the point. It'd be fucking boring if we were all exactly the same. You know what I mean? Well, and to your point, you know, if you think about that just in the in the broader scheme of things, an inmate to a guy who's just a firefighter his whole life, those are a lot different type people than, say, your next door neighbor. And we argue with our next door neighbor about politics all the time Mm -hmm. and we're living next door. So that gap really to your next door neighbor isn't that big, but we make it big. Whereas an inmate to a regular nine to five, you know, firefighter, that could be potentially be a very big gap in the different types of people. And they still come together for a common cause. So if they can do it to your point, that's, that's, that's what I'm trying to get at is like, if they can do it and you're illustrating that in there and it's happening every day in real life, it's not just a show that happens. Yeah. If they can do it. Yeah. I think the message is, is a good one that we all should be able to do it. Exactly. Exactly. I just think it's a time where we're, you know, it's like everybody needs to take a breath and a step back and, 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 you know, treat each other, you know, as, as brother and sister, um, like it, like we were intended to, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and just, um, you know, but sometimes it's, I think that's the way the world is. And that's the way that life is, is that sometimes you need to, you have to go through hard times to be reminded of those things. Exactly. Yeah. And I think our differences are highlighted and featured and, and those, those are the stories really the differences, but there's a lot of, a lot of good and commonalities between us that don't get the attention. Totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, and that's the unfortunate reality of the world is like, you know, I, I, I sort of laugh. I was like thinking about it the other day. And, you know, when you watch, uh, you watch Anchorman, right? Yeah. (laughs) And Ron Burgundy is reporting the news and it's the car chase and nothing is happening at the end, right? You find out it's like some old woman who, uh, you know, just didn't know she was being tailed by the cops or whatever. And it's this big extravagant car chase and it has these huge numbers. And, you know, we're guilty as a society of being obsessed with the the chaos and the drama mm-hmm. of everything and you know and, 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 and I, I think about that movie and that's it's very much how you know how we are as uh, as as people um but i also see positive messages and positive storytelling and you know positive news things that we see 
is also really effective and uplifting. And so, I, you know, I feel like instead of showing the showing the uh, the highlighted extravagant drama, yeah, we need to focus on the positive of the world and and you know try and get people to embrace that. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely a good goal. Like, uh, what about Veronica Corningstone? Remember her? Veronica, I definitely remember Veronica Corningstone. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love that. I love that movie. But I mean, as an actor, you on. have to. It's one of the greatest film works of all time. I think. Oh, dude! It's the. I mean, Ron Bergen. Just all of those characters in that movie <laughs> constantly kill me. And the 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 Panther. What is it, the Panther piss or whatever he's wearing? The cologne. And oh yeah, sixty yeah. percent of the time it works every time. Yeah, I know. it's all dude, all of it. Uh, yeah, it, I know. I, I feel like we need some more comedies like that, and I we know. haven't had one in a while. And I feel like, you know, it's. I feel like people are so worried about about uh, about upsetting anybody. I think everybody has such such thin skin that nobody wants to like yeah. write a comedy like that because they're worried that somebody will be offended by anything. I know. And, and it's like even um, my daughter went and saw Barbie last night and she said that, you know, it's good. It's like a unique storyline, this and that. You know, there's a little bit more political undertones. Like that's mm -hmm. what's like, it seems like there, it, that has to tie in with every whatever movie nowadays is they got to get their little political stuff in there too. And it's like, can we just freaking watch a movie? Do we I, have to, I just want to be entertained. Just want to be entertained. I mean, does yeah. it have to be so anyway? I'm, I'm like, I told her, I said, well, yeah, that's every movie these days yeah. for whatever reason. But uh, yeah, I mean, um, I feel that, like, I feel like a lot of these things too, you know, a lot of, a lot of stuff like this is seem, always seems like it's a trending thing. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, you go through these, these ebbs and flows, yeah. right? And It'll be back to classic filmmaking, I hope. I, I believe it will. I believe, um, I believe, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of this stuff is business and, you know, uh, when they, when you eventually realize off of numbers that, you know, the folks want to be entertained, yeah. they just want to watch, you know, a, a comedy or they just want to watch an old Western. That's the same thing that, you know, they loved about Tombstone. And yeah. I think eventually, you know, we'll get back to that. And, um, that's, yeah. 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 No, I, I think so too, because right, as you said, it is a business. They're not going to look at these budgets and take in the ass and be like, no pun intended there, but it's like, and like, okay, well, I guess we didn't serving that political message didn't serve us well in business. So, yeah. so hopefully, but I don't know. Um, I, I was thinking something else too, before I got distracted. Um, so the, the inmates, do they, when they fight fire, do they get all the same gear and the same training? Cause I would like, I would think somebody who's got like uh, looking for, you know, the devil's advocate, uh, are they just thrown out there and say, good luck? Or how does that work with inmates? No. So they, they get the same training, I believe is an F2, uh, which I think is a seasonal firefighter. And so they have, um, they go through training, um, you know, they definitely don't have the same level of gear, mm -hmm. but they have gear. And the thing about these folks, if you talk to a lot of firefighters, um, a lot of these inmate firefighters are, do they're busting their ass. Mm -hmm. They're doing some of the hardest work on a fire line. They're cutting hand, hand line. Um, and they're hiking into some of the shittiest, most remote, grueling country. And you don't see them complaining. Yeah. They sit there and they're, so they're the sled explain, dogs. Yeah, explain cutting a hand line because I don't think people, a lot of people probably don't know what yeah. that is. Yeah. So, you know, the big thing about big wild wildland fires is you can't put them out. It's just they're out of control. And that's not something that you can do. What you do is you contain it. Mm -hmm. You try and basically get ahead of this fire, predict its direction, and create a big enough break to where you can contain it to an area and you let it burn out in that area. Um, they can use, you know, fire retardant drops, water drops, but a big thing they do is they cut hand line and it can be, you can cut line with a dozer if the terrain allows it. Um, but a lot of these remote areas, a lot of these remote fires have to be cut with hand tools. So basically they use a, a McLeod is a common tool. looks like a big hoe that you would hoe your garden with. Mm -hmm. Um, it has a sort of a, a a rakey looking side and then it's got a huge blade on the one side and basically the idea is to 
the idea is you have to create a brake that is, what is it, one and a half times the fuel height line mm. back. And you're trying to go down to raw material. So you're trying to go down to, to dirt. Mm -hmm. And you're basically cutting a, looks like a road mm -hmm. between that fire and the new fuel. Um, the other so thing, if it's a 40 foot tree right there, you have to cut a 60 foot line. Yeah. Is yeah. That, 60 feet back. And then you'll, <clears throat> you'll be running that, you know, as much of the whole perimeter as you can, basically. And they use Polanski's and, and yeah, Pulaski's McLeod's, mm -hmm. um, you know, they'll have other sort it's of like hard, tools. hard it, manual labor. It's serious manual Hot labor. as fuck, dirty. You're plus you're wearing all the gear. That's gotta be hot. Yeah. That Nomex is super hot. I mean, you know, you're, you're carrying your pack. A lot of these folks are carrying saws. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you're, you're hiking your ass off and, you know, I've, I've, I've been, I've been in the outdoors and, and hunted and hiked around with, you know, my redneck buddies who, who still wear, you know, like logging boots in the right. back country with a three inch Corks, heel. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm always in there going like, man, those things weigh five pounds each. Yeah. And th those are the boots they're wearing. Yeah. You know, they're, they're hiking in those things and eating these terrible little to go meals that they're warming up on you know, fire engine blocks and exhaust pipes and trying to get yeah. their shitty burrito warm. And there's nothing, nothing glamorous about it. It's, it's serious, serious, hard manual labor. And, you know, a lot of times what they do is the, the inmates will be also assigned to clean up at the end. So they'll, they'll be out there on the fire mm. and then they'll have to go and do cleanup, mop up. And so, you know, if they, That's if probably they, because the, the crew gets sent somewhere else, mm -hmm. but the inmates are, must be based fairly close to there, I would guess. Yeah. So they, they're the ones, yeah, tasked with the crew. Which is, which is not a fun job either, right? Because uh -huh. you're going through this, there's little, you know, hot spots that they have to put out, you know, in the middle of the fire. And, you know, if they run a, if they run a hose lay, fucking mile and a half long mm -hmm. of fire hose, they, they're picking all of that up and hauling it all back. That hose is heavy too. It is no joke. What mm -hmm. these what these people do is um is intense, you know, and it's not it's not, not for like even aside from the inmates, it's not for money. No. Like the firefighters aren't it's not like anybody's getting rich off this shit. Not at all. You know, I think and th and that's a big issue that is kind of going on right now. I know um uh there's a, an organization called the Grassroots uh Wildland Fire Federation, I believe, or something like that. And and uh a lot of these organizations, a lot of these, uh, like hot shots and, you know, wildland firefighters right now are trying to advocate for, for higher pay. Cause you know, if you read stories, all these people, and there's guys who you know, do this job for 25 years and they're away from their family for months at a time, mm -hmm. you know, and work an entire fire season and they might make, you know, 20 grand and there's a lot that they sacrifice again, you know, mentally, um, you know, PTSD is a big issue in this community. Um, you know, the, the, the rate of, of divorce is extremely high. The rate of cancer that they get is like 70% higher than the mm. average person. Like they're exposed to a lot of things. And, you know, I think, uh, I think just as, as we need to do better helping our veterans, we need to do it better helping these folks as well. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's a, to me, it's the same category too, because in the military, they're not doing it for the money either. You know, the, most of these soldiers aren't making hardly anything. No. They're doing it because they're serving the country. Mm -hmm. The, uh, if I was, if I was looking at, you know, objectively, I think military is doing a better job once the, our soldiers get out of evaluating maybe long-term, you know, whether it's who, who knows, disabilities, mm -hmm. but I wonder if that's probably not happening with the firefighters. No, and I th and I think with the military, I think it's even that's even a, a newer thing that we're mm -hmm. doing. Like we're starting to get better at that, you know. And I think um, I think for years, you know, they were really struggling to deal with that, which is why, you know, folks come back and we see uh, a lot of these men and women become homeless and um, have have drug issues and and you know, a lot of problems because they weren't being taken care of. Thankfully, mm -hmm. I think people are starting to, to realize that and shed light on that and, and go, look, these people gave everything. They sacrificed 
everything for you, mm -hmm. for your family, and they, and you need to do better. Yeah. Once they do their four years, eight years, however many years, even if it's 20 years, they're still not that old. You know, mm -hmm. if you go in when you're 20, 20 years, you're 40. I mean, there's a lot of life left that you're dealing with whatever happened yeah. as you serve. So yeah, I mean, we, we owe it to them to do better. And I'm glad, I know it's going better, um, but it's been a process. I would think that, you know, the wild on firefighters deserve the same type of consideration yeah. because as you said, it's, it's not for the money. It's, it's serving a greater purpose and there's a lot of risk associated. It's hard work too. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's all of those things. It's, there's a, just like the military, there's a lot of, a tremendous amount of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's for, uh, it's for everyone. It's these people are serving, you know, they're serving our country. Yeah. I, I was, uh, also curious to get your, your opinion on, you mentioned that fires are, you know, worse than they have been or like all over the West. Why do you think that that's happening? Why do you think these fires have been, it's been changing is getting worse? Well, <clears throat> I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a, a fire scientist um, or any scientist by any means, but I think it's, I think there's a lot of contributing factors. Um, you know, I don't know if it's a, if it's a, a, a partially a climate change issue, if it's a, um, a timber management, timber management issue. I, I kind of think it, it, maybe it's, maybe it's a combination of, of all these things. Mm -hmm. And I think, unfortunately, um, again with a division you know i i read a i read a, a um not an essay but a, a letter that a gentleman wrote down in northern california um to the politicians and he was a he was a a, a rancher a cowboy who had been cowboying up in the national forest running beef cows for you know his family for 150 years mm -hmm. and and he wrote this really incredible letter to them. Basically, you know, this is a, a grown man, a cowboy, who you could tell was basically in tears when he wrote this thing. Because he said, you know, he's like, I, I weep for the mountains. I weep for, you know, the livestock. Um, he's like, you know, my family's been here for 150 years. And in one fire, we lost everything. Their, their cattle were all burned in the fire. Hmm. And he's like, you know, he's like, I'm mad at everyone and no one at the same time. And he said you know, a big problem is you have all these people who can't agree on something. Mm -hmm. And so instead they fight over it. You know, they're, you have, you have one side that's saying, no, this is just global warming. And then you have another side that says, you know, we need to, we need to burn more often. We need, you know, we need timber management. We need to, to selectively cut and go through, um, cause there's too much fuel and, because of that, they can't come to some sort of middle mm -hmm. ground agreement. And, and, you know, the simple fact is obviously there is a problem. Mm -hmm. There's a reason these are here, you know, and, and I've seen different sides too, that have said that for so long, we were too good at putting out fires. Mm. Cause I guess they used to have an old rule where a fire had to be put out, you know, by X amount of hours from it starting. Mm -hmm. And, by doing that, great, you put the fire out, but you weren't allowing sort of the natural cleansing process of the earth to burn itself. And, you know, and, and a lot of these burns are actually healthy for the ground, right? Mm -hmm. If they're, if they don't become these mega fires, right? They, you know, new seeds, you know, can germinate. Um, all of a sudden you get rid of this undergrowth and, and, well, you There's know, no with, with hunting, when I, when I hunt in the wilderness, if you're, you know, go to like a five-year-old burn, it's going to be good. Yeah. You know, that's where the animals are because of that. Exactly. There's all this new life in there. There's mm -hmm. new growth and there's, there's, you know, healthy plants. And so I, th I think, um, you know, I, I have to look at the people who, who I believe, you know, didn't actually just l learn it out of a book. You know, I believe that while you can learn a lot that way, one of the ways you can learn the most is by actually being boots on the ground mm -hmm. and living in a place, experiencing it firsthand, yeah. seeing it. And I think a lot of these firefighters and a lot of these folks who have learned about, you know, doing prescribed burns have realized is that 
this is kind of the best way to manage these things is to to burn these things. And again, with timber management, you know, you look back and while we were able to, to harvest more lumber and, and, you know, obviously not clear cutting, but like selectively harvesting and going through, you look at those areas and photographs and those areas don't burn the same as the ones that have never been touched. Right. Um, you know, and I, I'm, I'm married to a woman whose family was in the timber industry. And so I, I've, I've spoke to a lot of those people and, you know, have a lot of experience being around them and seeing a lot of these pictures. Yeah. Um, and hearing their stories. Yeah. I, I, you know, they make it this bipartisan issue and it's like, I mean, I know you're, uh, we don't get too political, but I see you got your, your hat on there, for your, <laughs> your favorite candidates. That's right. <laughs> no, but I saw, a, I saw a post today from Hil Hillary Clinton and she said something like how hot it's been. And if, if you're, you know, sweltering in the heat, think a magna MAGA Republican. It's just like, what are you talking about? It's hot. So it's Donald Trump's voters fault. Yeah. I mean, what do we, you know, so you say, it, I just we, feel like stuff like that is just divisive. Again, I mean, what's it's the like, point. Yeah. So yeah, you, you say it's like, can you just focus on the issue and what, how to resolve it? No, it's always got to be like taking shots from one side to the other. It's like hot weather and, and somehow, you know, no, MAGA I, Republicans did it. You know, I, I got to think about the thing that I tell my seven year old all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. And my wife is the one who who's in charge of this, who, who actually came up with it. So I have to give her the credit because like all moms really deserve they're They're really the champions of the house. Yeah. Um, but we always tell him, you know, when he says something to his brother, when he says something to somebody, we say, Bo, helpful or hurtful. Yeah. And Pretty it's as simple. simple as it's as simple <laughs> as that. Is, yeah. is what you were saying helpful or yeah. is it hurtful? Right. And. And that's it. It's yeah. like, if you're not being helpful, that would, that would change a lot of discussions we have out there right now. You know, now. I mean, but I think it's as simple as that. I, it's, it like, is. it's like, think about what you're about to say and is what you're going to say, is it actually going to be constructive? Is it helpful mm -hmm. or is it negative? Is it hurtful? Is this, is this actually just, you know, causing more division? Right. Right. Yeah, I know. I mean, I get, you know, I think everybody's burned out on the political in fighting and back and forth and the mud slinging, but yeah. man, I don't know. Hopefully, just like the movie industry, hopefully it's like it an ebb and flow, and we're just kind of you know getting through the worst of it, and it's going to get better. Yeah. But, um, so I was curious. Let's let's we talked about your your latest show. How did I mean? I've it seems like I've seen you and your name forever in movies and TV. How did that? How long you been doing? When did you start, and how did you get started? I started when I was, uh, I think I was twelve. Totally fell into it. Um, you know, I grew up in a town of a thousand people in Northern California. Mm -hmm. You know, being an actor was not something that even seemed real. It only happened in the movies. And I went to like an improv class with a friend one day after school because I was bored and we had nothing to do and. Um, like middle school then middle school. Yeah. Met this guy who said, Hey, I think you'd be a good actor. You know, one of those weird stories that everybody, you know, everybody has that person calling them off the street kind yeah. of thing, you know? And, um, and my parents were really supportive and, you know, I didn't know what being an actor meant. And I flew down to LA, walked into an agency, read a, a Reese's peanut butter cup cereal <laughs> commercial audition for these folks. Shit, and that um, sounds good. good I, know, I can crush that right now. <laughs> um, and all of a sudden they were like, yeah, we'd love to represent you. Um, went on a couple of auditions and I got, uh, I got lucky, man. I got really lucky. I know mm. that this is a job and industry where it's really difficult to break into. And so I don't take, I don't take it for granted. I know that I got lucky. Um, you know, I got the second lead of a Fox movie, like, really soon. Hmm. Um, you know, I know I was also super fortunate and, you know, fate would have it that at the time I wanted to race cars growing up. So that hmm. was like, that was what I wanted to do. As we all know, I've been putting all my guests through a pretty good cardio session on Mount Pisgah. Go Ruck is a welcome new addition to the podcast and lift run shoot series. I love the 80 pound sandbags, but I'm not sure how my guests feel about it. But what do they say? Pain is weakness leaving the body. 
All the people at Go Rock are beasts, and I'm thrilled to partner with them. We use the rocks and sandbags on almost every episode, and now you can take your training to the next level as they are offering listeners 10% off when you use code CAM, C-A-M, at GORUCK.com. See you guys on the mountain. You better not forget that weight. Brio is the first smokeless fire pit in the world designed around the idea of producing less smoke, all while allowing the surfaces to evenly cook your favorite cut of meat. The grill is easy to use, portable, and a must for elk camp. With season right around the corner, add a Brio to the list and have your campfire and camp stove all in one. They have a number of different patio setups as well as hunting setups, so head to Brio.co and order yours today. And I was karting, I was racing go-karts, you know, dreamed of of racing Indy cars, you know, with Indy 500. And- uh, Who's your favorite driver? Oh man, I mean, I have a lot now. Um, And I I know a lot of these guys over the years from just spending time with the races, but um, you know, Jimmy Vassar, um, Max Pappas are good buddies. And I I, I love those guys, I think they're super talented. You know, and if you look at a lot of the, the talent um, that unfortunately went through some struggling times, you know, Alan Sir Jr., guys like that. Um, you know, obviously the Andretti family is legendary mm-hmm. in open wheel racing, the Ray Halls. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I was racing carts and this movie happened to be about three kids who rob a bank on go-karts. Really? Okay. <laughs> so I went in and I'm like, <laughs> this is me. Yeah. I'm like, guys, this is I'm the guy. You, you're not gonna. You're not gonna find somebody else. I'm the guy. Yeah. And uh, so they brought a go kart in, and like, okay, well, tell us about it. And I looked at it and told them everything about it, and mm. they're like, holy shit, this is the guy. And you know, I don't even know if I could really act then. Mm-hmm. I think they just knew I was. Uh, I was the the most authentic thing that they were gonna yeah. get. Um, and that sort of, you know, it was like proof of concept, right? I mean, and, and that's how that's how the industry is. It's, it's difficult to break in, but once you get in, then it be kind of becomes easier. Once you, you continue to prove yourself. Um, you know, and so I did that movie and I did the pacifier with Vin Diesel. Um, yeah. That Tanner just mentioned that the other day. Oh, t- he was talking to Tyler and you yeah. know, it's like, cause you're talking about what you've been in and mentioned that. And it's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. They looked it up and it's like, yeah, that's right. Of course. Everybody's seen that one. Yeah. Like a little bleach blonde hair. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I did the, I did the Nancy Drew movie, the kid, kid, like I did all these family movies, kid mm-hmm. movies. Um, you know, I played everybody's son at one point. And then as I got older, uh, you know, I was, I was, I have great agents who were helping me make these decisions along the way, but you know, the, the, the transition from child actor to adult actor is a, is a difficult one. Hmm. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's hard to make that jump. I mean, you see folks like Haley Joel Osment and Macaulay Culkin and all these people, you know, they're like this rock star kid actor. And then making that transition to an adult, it's, it's, I don't know. It's hard for an audience to, I think, sort of see them as that different right. age, as that different character. And um, I sort of like led into those. So it was like as I had these child, you know, kid actor roles and I eventually was still playing like the son of people, but they were more adult movies. Mm-hmm. You know, I did this movie called Chloe, um, which is like an erotic thriller, mm. as I think it would be titled. Um, and it was, I played Liam Neeson and Julianne Moore's son, um, and Amanda Seyfried was in it. And, uh, it's a dark, twisted, you know, intense movie, but I was still playing, you know, this 19 year old, like the son. And so that was kind of, I think helped my transition mm-hmm. to an adult actor and finding those awkward, that one role, kind of the mid, the <clears throat> mid midstream role. Yeah. It's like, it's, how do you, how do you feel that, that awkward age that, Mm-hmm. every guy goes through, you know, and where does that fit into TV? Yeah, I get that. I see, I, I, I feel for the women who were the, like the, the lead, the star sex symbol type role, and then they have to go to the mom. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's that same, they're a little later than probably you were from going from the son to the, to the lead, but going from that to the mom. And I see, I see those actresses and I wonder that I, figure that's got to be hard. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think, I think it is. I think that, 
I think that first transition that I'm talking about is difficult. And I think that transition from, like you're saying, from the, the, the hot sex symbol, you know, starlet, starlet, like to becoming the, the matriarch character Mm -hmm. is a difficult one. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult on people's ego, on their self-esteem, on all these things, because you start going like, man, I'm not that, I'm not that girl anymore. I'm not that guy anymore. You're not the big picture on the poster. You're like the little, there's, there's the big character and then you're the little one. Totally. (laughs) That's gotta be hard. I think it's, I, I I really think it is difficult for Mm -hmm. some people are better at dealing with it than others. And I think, you know, I have a, a, a buddy who's an actor on, on my show right now, Kevin Alejandro. And he said something to me just recently that I think, you know, is important, but it also sort of relates to stuff like that is like, instead of looking at the negative side of it, or, you know, this scene, you know, could be better, whatever it is. He's like, my job is, it doesn't matter how, what the scene is, how good the scene is. Um, the role is like, my job is to make it better. My mm-hmm. job is to make it something. Mm-hmm. And so I think if you look at it that way, and you know, you are one of those mom characters. If you look at it and, and look at it as the ch- as the challenge, look at the challenge of it. And how do I take this thing that, you know, maybe my first instinct is it's not that exciting or I'm not that character that I really want to be. And how do I take that and make it into something great? Right. And I think that's one thing that great actors do. Mm-hmm. Like really, really exceptional actors are able to take something that is, you know, maybe already pretty good, but either way they take that and they make it better. They make elevate. it brilliant. Cause yeah, you could, you could, you always say like, no matter what you're doing, elevate the situation. A hundred percent. Make it better. Even if you're a role player or a maybe, yeah, that I don't know what that would be termed in acting, but you can still make, make the scene, you know? Yeah. And so people remember that scene and maybe it's like, you got a, a small part in the movie, but that one scene, whatever you killed it and the, the picture. Totally. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's, I think it's, man, that's a, it's something that relates to life too. You know, it's like, yeah, it's like, sure. you know, your job, your, whatever it is you're doing, it's like, you know, instead of, instead of looking at the negative side of it or it not being as great as you wish, like fucking make it great. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, you know, in a business, there's only one CEO, but even the janitor can make a difference. You know, hundred percent. It's a, I was curious about this too. I was thinking because I've, freaking suck like memorizing lines so i was thinking like if i was an actor like you and you got somebody on set who just keeps screwing it up how frustrating is that i'm sure you've had that you've had a long career but there's people who yeah they just kill it and you're probably learning from them all the time then there's people who are like holy shit this guy fucking sucks you can't remember anything yeah what happens like uh, do people get frustrated it yeah it's it's hard i've i've uh i've dealt with that Quite a few times. Because um, if you kill, I'm just like envisioning it. If you kill a scene and you know, like you just did it and then they fuck that up and then you got to do it again. Yeah. Is that, that would piss me off. <laughs> I think it, it can be really frustrating. And I, you know, and I think that for me, the hardest part about it is not so much that, you know, I have to do it again because their, their, their stuff was bad. What usually happens is in those moments you know, as an actor, what you, what you hope, right, is that a scene essentially becomes real. So those words that you've memorized basically become a part of you. They're a part of your dialogue, your conversation. So when you're in this scene, the acting kind of goes away and you're just, you're really listening and communicating with the person and you're having this conversation, whatever it is. And I think the hardest thing is when people don't know their lines or they're struggling with that, you see them thinking when you're talking to them about what their lines are and you start realizing that they're not present. Mm -hmm. And when somebody else isn't present in the scene, it's difficult for you to stay present. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to fall out of it and sort of look around the room and see all the camera operators and crew that are standing back there Mm -hmm. when this person is like, what is my line? Like, you know, it, all of a sudden you're taken out of it. And that to me is the most frustrating part. It's like when you feel like you're really right there and you're present and you're emotionally, you know, totally in, and then this person keeps bringing you out. Yeah. That's when it gets frustrating. I bet. And you're like, you know, and, and it can be really frustrating when, when it's 
you know, I mean, scenes are always, you know, they're, they're like a tennis match. Like you need somebody to sit there and, and, you know, volley with you. But sometimes scenes will be heavier handed for one character, right? Like you might have a really emotional scene for your character and the other person is kind of just coming into it. Yeah. And so that's usually when it's really frustrating is because I try and feel like if, even if I'm a small part of a scene, then somebody's having a, a really important scene for their character. I'm going to, I'm going to give you everything that I have mm -hmm. because I want you to get to the place that you need to get to mm -hmm. emotionally. And so if I do that, I expect you to reciprocate. And so then when I have that scene for me, I want you to be there and be fully with me. Well, you lock you, me in. Yeah. You almost have to, you're serving up the meatball so they can jack it out of the park. Right. Yeah. And I think a, a director would have to notice that or whoever's running the scene, they'd have to notice that, yeah, you fucking killed this part, which allowed them to nail their part, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, it's like a symphony, symphony a little bit, but you know, what reminded me, I was just, as you were talking, like, and one thing that I love about it too, is when you're talking about this business, like you're locked in, like talking to me, I can mm -hmm. tell like, this is your passion. You know what I mean? You're yeah. like, so into it's the business, but, um, I was thinking about there's a, a new show out and I only watched like maybe one and a half episodes, but it, it was pretty good. And it's called, it's Johnny Depp's daughters in it. Okay. Do you know that show? I've, I've, I haven't seen the show, but I know what you're talking about. But so she was singing right in this scene and, um, uh, she was, I think making a music video and she was up there singing and she'd been struggling and she said, no, you, I've been going through a lot, my mom, this and that. So she'd been distracted. Then she nailed this one take just fucking killed it and everybody did great she did gr the but the key was she did great and the camera was fucked up and so she came over she's like do we get it do we get it everything how did i look you know because she knew she'd done good and then the camera operator said we gotta do it again we something with the focus whatever that would be you know and then she sat down and she was crying and like her feet were bleeding had like the, the costume was rubbing her raw and uh, that it, I could just see like when you put yourself out and it, everything goes perfect, then somebody else or something else mm -hmm. takes away from your perfect performance. I mean, how frustrating is that as an actor? I mean, I'm sure that happens, right? It, yeah, no, that totally happens. Um, you know, there's always, I'm trying to think of like certain situations where I've like personally experienced it, but I've been through it all you know i've seen <clears throat> i've seen focus be soft or you know i've seen uh somebody somebody come in and ruin a take they walk in at the wrong time mm. or um you know all of a sudden the, the the weirdest one every once in a while and we had this one night on seal team and is this weird thing of like when you're shooting so many hours and you become exhausted. You know, that feeling of when you basically start to become a little delusional, mm -hmm. right? Like you're so tired, you get past the tired point and you kind of start to go crazy. Mm -hmm. There's this thing that happens every once in a while where you start to go so crazy and, and your head is filled with all these lines and you've been doing them over and over and over and over and over again. And for whatever reason, the only thing you can do is laugh. <laughs> yeah. And we were filming SEAL Team one night and uh, we had this director who was tough. I'll just, I'll say that. <laughs> and, and uh, we're sitting there and it's the middle of the night and we're doing the scene. We're loading on this bus to go out in an op and we're waiting in between setups and we start to get ready to roll. And it's a scene with me, AJ, Neil, and uh and david and the four of us are getting around and we're coming up with a plan and for whatever reason aj had his beanie on really low and he looked like it was like gordon fisherman or something you know <laughs> mm -hmm. and we all kind of looked at him as he started to talk in the scene and all of a sudden one of us sort of just started to just laugh like this uncontrollable <laughs> it's like as if you were like a high school like yeah. kid stoned laugh you know or in church when you're not supposed to laugh dude you just get the <laughs> like the giggles like yeah. the bad giggles and one of us started and then it set everybody off and so then for about the next fucking 
30, 45 minutes. Oh, man. Every time we would try to roll, <laughs> oh. one person, and when one person would go, the next person would go. And I'm sitting there, I should, you know, <clears throat> and I'm biting my tongue <laughs> inside my mouth. I'm biting my lip. I can't look anybody in the eyes because I'm going to start laughing. <laughs> yeah. And, and it went on and on and on. And so that's a, that's a weird. Was it director pissed? Yeah, you could tell he really started to lose his shit. <laughs> and I think, I think we felt, we all felt a little bad for the crew for mm-hmm. having to deal with it. Yeah. Because, you know, these folks sit there and work their ass off and they want to go home. I don't think any of us felt that bad for the director at that point because <laughs> yeah. he was kind of pissing he's everybody a, off anyways. So, yeah. But, uh, <clears throat> Man, that's that's one of those things that happens. But yeah, like you said, it you definitely have times where where it's a, a, a really serious take and some sort of something goes wrong. Yeah. Um and it's hard. But I think there's also weirdly enough, there's also the times where that thing goes wrong and then it pisses you off so much mm-hmm. and you're so frustrated that then you deliver a performance on the next one that's even better. Yeah, tunnel vision, focus. Yeah, yeah, like you have this, all of a sudden there's this new emotion that gets kind of poured into it mm. that's different from what you were doing. Mm-hmm. And the director comes somewhere is like, that was fucking great. Like, that was even better. Yeah, that and makes like, feel good. And you're like, was it? And like, yeah, and then you watch it back and you're like, oh shit, yeah, I guess whatever it was that just happened that sort of got into my head actually made me even more like there and bring yeah. it. What would, what I'd probably find myself doing is watching it back and like if everybody else kicked ass and then I didn't look that great because I made some weird face or whatever, be like, now let's do that one again because I don't look great. (laughs) Yeah. That was a really bad take for me guys. Yeah. Yeah. But you only had one line. I know it just wasn't good. I need to do one more. I need to to flex more. I didn't flex enough. Yeah. Well, you, that was fun for me because one time you, I was in LA and you invited me to the set of SEAL team Yeah. and, uh. That was cool. I mean, I, I don't know, watching you guys shoot that. And I think it was, I think the scene was on a plane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was, I mean, I don't know. You, probably, like don't, or you probably don't remember it. But I remember. <clears throat> no, we were packing gear. I know. I'm going to have to get you. Yeah, packing now, gear. That's I'm right. I'm going to have to get you on a fire country now because I know, uh, you know, that's the, the hard thing is like, you know, you never know what's going to ultimately make a cut. And obviously that scene got super truncated. <clears throat> I mean, pretty much. You know, we have a 50 page script, right? And we got 42 minutes of airtime and it's basically a page a minute. And so inevitably every episode stuff ends up on the cutting room floor. Right. And it's usually anything that is filled with, with time. It's, it's anything that it's those dramatic moments. It's the pauses. It's anything that, you know, isn't like super important information story wise, um, you know, or, or gaps between, you know, dramatic pauses between lines, like stuff like that will get cut in television a lot. Um, and so I know, I, uh, yeah, we had that gear packing scene, but now we're going <laughs> yeah. to we have to get you like, you know, in an orange, oh, in an yeah. orange jumpsuit on the fire line or something. Oh, that, that'd be, t- I mean, I have a lot of respect, not, I think just growing up here, but for the, the wildland firefighters, of course, but also the loggers, all the timber industry, yeah. that is such a hard way to make a living in the mountains. And I, you know, that's what I grew up in a small little logging town here out, outside of town, Springfield. But uh, yeah, I mean, those guys work their asses off. So I love, I love that you're highlighting that. Yeah. Not the lifestyle, but like, I guess it is a lifestyle, but it's also a job, but it's an important, serving an important need for our communities and you for know, sure. the I think forests and that's a big thing, you know, I think that we're, we're doing on our show. And I think, uh, you know, I think other shows too, like even, you know, Yellowstone, right? Like Yellowstone was like a real sort of phenomenon, like blew up, you know, everybody thinks they're a cowboy now, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's got a cowboy hat and thinks I they're know. a button. But, uh, aside from that, I think it opened a lot of people's eyes to, nature and to the outdoors and to the beauty of the mountains and you know this rural lifestyle of living um and small town america living Mm -hmm. you know something that obviously a lot of people in this country um as soon as you leave either coast experience almost every day right but a lot of people in the cities don't and um you know it's something that that we sort of depict as well in, in fire country you know is is 
what it's like to live in a small town. And because I think those of us who, who grew up in it, you know, maybe at first when you, when you live and grow up in one of those towns, you're like, oh, I want to, I want to, you know, go out and see other things. Yeah. But then you do and you realize how great it was. Yeah. And you come back and you're like, oh, there's a reason, you know, there, there's something about this place that is so special. And it's, you know, there's something that's really nice and wholesome about being able to walk down the street and wave at your neighbor because you know them mm -hmm. and being able to go into town and go to the grocery store and, you know, you know, you know, the, the woman who works behind the cash register and, yeah. and the person behind the meat market and wh whatever it is. And, you know, it's a, uh, it, that's a big part of the show is, is just showing, you know, having a lot of that, that rural scope and showing the woods and the outdoors, but also just that small town community and seeing again, people come together. Well, I mean, you mentioned it where you're living now, you talked about how, you know, high, or sports, football, basketball is so popular. And that's what, that's the biggest thing I remember about being in a small town. I mean, I only had 24 kids in my graduating class mm -hmm. or 28, something like that is very small. But if you had a good football game on Friday night, the whole town was there. Yeah. So you'd go to the grocery store to get a Mountain Dew the next day and you scored a touchdown and guys, you know, you see somebody there and like good game last night that fucking feels good. Yeah. You know, and that's that small town community where, yeah, we're all, we're all watching the high school compete. And it's just like, you don't get that. You know, we always wanted to go, Hey, you want to go to town, go to the movies, go to pizza. And so going to town was like a big thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's 20 miles into town. But then when I look back on it now, I'm like, God, thank God for that small town life. Totally. You know, Cause it's so pure. It's like, we didn't have any, what were we going to do? Let's go play catch with the football. That's yeah. what we did. Or go to the swimming hole or hey, you know, to make money. And uh, man, I'm I'm so glad that, you know, I don't know, you said your town was a thousand, it's pretty small too. So I, I'm sure you had that same type of vibe. Totally, yeah. It's like, I, you know, most of my friends who I'm still really close with, I've, you know, I grew up with since kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Like I, I have businesses now with buddies who I went to preschool with. Hmm. And yeah, it's, you know, the town that we're, we're in here, you know, and up in, in Washington now, is also like that. It's this uh, hardworking, you know, farming community of folks who who really come together for every event. It's mm -hmm. like and 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 any win in the town, any win at the high school, it's not just the high school wins or those kids. It's the town that wins. Yeah, and everybody rallies behind that. Yeah, and for me, like people, you know, I think some people look at that as as being small. Mm -hmm. But I kind of just see it as being wholesome and, and, you know, and, and having like a lot of heart and just getting to see everybody celebrate that and the smile on people's faces. For me, it's just positive. It's good yeah. stuff. You know, it's like that good sort of, uh, it's that good, like get, get your kids out and let them play in the dirt, you know? I know. It's like let them touch the trees and eat some shit off the ground and leaves yeah. and stuff, you know, it's, you a, know, the, the fabric of that small, that holds that small town together is like, I think the country could use a lot of that, you know, yeah. because you're more, you're more tied to the land because you're out in it or you work in it. You're more tied to, to the community as we talked about because of sports and because of the school. And it's like, that's what's, you know, I guess you can't change. We we'll never change big cities. You can't make a big city small, but what's important to that, those small town communities and values, man, that would help the whole country. Yeah. We're, we're lucky to have grown up in it. It's an, it's an important, it's important that they, that they, maintain that and they hold on to that you know i think um like you said you know i think uh, it's a blessing to be able to experience that and obviously not everybody does um and so we're fortunate but um you know i think those values and and that stuff is good i think mm -hmm. uh you know that's how i want to raise my boys and um yeah yeah, I could have done without all the drinking that I did in the small town, but yeah, <laughs> but we got past that. There's too. some shenanigans that the, come with it for the, sure. Yeah, I mean, when there's not much to do and you're old and everybody's like, "Hey, let's go to the rock pit, build a fire, and drink beer." I mean, it sounds pretty good, but it doesn't lead to anything positive. <laughs> That's so right. I was, I had to weather that storm. Um, I was curious, so I, I hate to keep bringing up the acting, but it's like I, I've, you know, I had one actor in Joel Courtney, and he was in uh, the. Uh, what was that movie? Je oh, Jesus Resurrection. And uh, it was good. But if uh, so over your career, who's been the best actor that you've worked with that you feel like you've learned the most from? Who was like 
because I know there's people who you watch, you watch like an athlete say run the hunt, like you say in bolt. And it's like, just like, Whoa, that's poetry motion. Who's been an actor like in that regard? Hmm. I mean, you know, I've been, I've been, I've been super fortunate throughout my career to, to work with, um, with a lot of really, really talented people. Um, and so I, you know, I'm, not taking anything away from any of them. Right, no. Um, they're all great. They're all Some great. Are, and Somebody might be the greatest. Somebody might be the greatest. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I think when I did, I think when I, when I did Chloe, those, working with, with specifically with, with Liam Neeson and Julianne Moore, and I know Liam Neeson now, you know, you see is more this, you, you know, uh, the taken, taken guy. The taken guy. <laughs> um, but even he sort of takes the piss out of himself for that. Like, I remember at that time, he's he was good, like, though. he is, but he was even saying, he's like, you know, in his big, thick Irish accent, this big, giant, tall, got, dude's got legs, like, literally up to my shoulders. Really? Um, but he was sort of like, you know, he's like, yeah, like, I'm not some action star. That's not who I am, you know? And, yeah. um, but if you, if you watch that guy, like, you watch him in um, um, uh, Schindler's List. Yeah. Like you watch him in Schindler's List and that performance that he gives, uh, you realize what that guy is capable of doing and how talented he is. And in that in that experience of doing that movie, I got to see two phenomenal actors who sort of approach their craft so differently. Hmm. Because for him, it's such a raw and natural thing that he just does, that just sort of bleeds out of him. And, and then there's Julianne Moore, who I think is an incredibly talented actress, you know, has done so much great work for so many years. And what I was amazed by her was, was her process was, was very different. But I went into her trailer one day to like, go over lines for a scene and she had every scene with, she had all these sticky notes all over her, her script. And they were all sort of like categorized by different colors and they meant different things. And it was just how much work she put into the work. Mm -hmm. Like she really, really, really put in the work. And then seeing how that translates to her characters was really incredible. And I think for me, what I realized is that everybody has their process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I guess it doesn't really matter how you get to that end result as long as you get there. And it's finding your process and, and, you know, what works for you. But those two actors for me are our next level. You know, I think when, when I did Bates Motel, Vera Farmiga, I think is a incredibly underrated actress who is hmm. insanely talented. You know, she was great, obviously, like in, you know, people know her from Up in the Air, or The Departed. Mm -hmm. um, and again, she's she's kind of... I guess like more like how I approach it, like from a, a natural sort of standpoint, but she's far better and, and, and she makes it look so easy. Like mm. she'll go into a scene and, you know, she's not a method actor. She's not like, I have to be this way. Don't talk to me. Right. She can be laughing, giggling, fun. And all of a sudden the cameras start rolling mm -hmm. and you see her just turn. And it's like, she, all of a sudden makes this instant switch hmm. to the character that she is. And in Bates Motel, she played a really, really crazy, kooky mom, like that had so many layers and you watch her make that turn. And I think that she's just, uh, I think she's a really special actress. Hmm. Is there a difference between like, cause you weren't classically trained, so to speak in acting. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference between classically trained actors and people who came into it like you did later just kind of just fit the, the you, you know, you got that opportunity. And it's like you knew go-karts and it's like that was your break. But then there's some people who have studied their whole life in, the, in theater. I mean, is there a difference between the two, do you think? Or all that matters is the end result? I think there is. I think there's a huge difference. And I think, um, I think both have, you know, have their setbacks and their positives. I think that you know, for me, because I wasn't really trained, um, I approached everything from just a, a natural place, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I feel like ultimately, 
when you watch a movie, you don't want to feel like somebody's acting. You want to feel like this is a person, you know, this isn't a character. Right. It's who they are. This is real. Well, I see that even people like look at you, you know, they, they saw a picture of you yesterday and they say, oh, your leg's back. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're so bought into your role. Was it Bodhi? Or, that that no, was Clay. Yeah. Or Clay. No, Clay lost his leg. <clears throat> right. And so, yeah, I mean whatever you're doing works because people are believing it. You know what I mean? No, for sure. And, and that, but that's taken years for me, I think, because, you know, I think what I've found is that, you know, for the people who aren't the trained actors who kind of come at it from this natural place, you can bring so much of that, but then you need to, then you need to figure out how to like find the nuance and act beyond it. Right. And so it's like, you know, that gets you so far. That's the basics. And then you got, yeah. And then mm -hmm. you got to figure out ways to add things, you know, to mm -hmm. your quiver, right? You got to, right. you got to have extra stuff to go to, to then, then adds that nuance to your performance. And, and I think that vice versa, I think that a lot of theater and trained actors come in already going to their bag of tricks. And so sometimes they, they lead with that mm -hmm. and you see it and you go, that's great, but you don't need to do that. You don't need to do that much. Mm -hmm. Just do the natural thing and then work that in. And right. so they're kind of like a backwards order. I see. Um, is how I usually see it, at least with folks who haven't been doing it a really, really long time. I think that once once you've been doing it 20, 30 years, you kind of, you stop realizing right away when you're acting with somebody like, oh, this person was trained or this person wasn't. Once they've been doing it long enough, um, it's harder to see those differences. Yeah, no, I, I understand. I mean, you reminded me of something else. I can't remember the actor, but he was in Gangs of New York. And Daniel, think, da Daniel Day Lewis. Yeah, and he was so, I remember reading that he was so in the role and like he couldn't turn it off. Like yeah. he'd go to a restaurant and still be like the, the guy from the movie. So you said Julianne Moore can just, you know, s switch, but, or uh, you said method acting. Mm -hmm. what, what's that? What's method? What does that mean? So it's it's pretty much like what you just said, you know, and Daniel Day Lewis is kind of he's sort of the king of it. Um mm -hmm. you know, I and I'm I have to say, you know, since you brought him up, I mean I would I, I feel like I'd probably argue that guy is the is is the greatest actor, I believe. Um he's incredible. Yeah. When you see him in a character, he's he is that character and they're always so different. And the the performance has so much nuance and you know and, and it can be like the tiniest little thing it could be mm -hmm. like a hand gesture that mm -hmm. he might do you know mm -hmm. but like just to think of that thing right and to me is like oh man it's next level yeah i can't i can't my brain doesn't even work that way you know yeah. I mean? like i'm trying to just focus on the one thing um what was the but, one where he was in about oil did you see that one that was there will be blood there will be blood yeah. i mean <sighs> Yeah, that was in, he was incredible. Well, dude, yeah. So he so basically what he does, you know, being a <clears throat> being a method actor is I mean, the the basic idea is, is you becoming that that character. OK, is you're so invested in the character that you you pull your own self out of it and you you become that character throughout the process of filming until you're done and fully commit yourself and you you know, he goes as far as, you know, when he did the crucible, like, and he's a cobbler, he, he became a cobbler mm. and he learned to make shoes mm -hmm. and he built the house that he like lives in, in the movie with his hands. Wow. And like, he really, and you know, he didn't get paid extra for doing that shit. Right. Like he does it because he's like, this is what I need to do. Give life to, become, to the role. Yeah. To mm -hmm. become this person. Um, and I think that, you know, he's, I mean, the dude basically gets nominated for an Oscar for every movie that he's ever done yeah. and usually wins. Um, and then he has to like retire, I think, for like five years just to right. like try and get himself back, which I think can be hard on, you know, your family. If mm -hmm. you're going to go home and all of a sudden you're the guy from there will be blood to your wife. Like yeah. my wife would kick my ass. Yeah, it's not going to work She'd be out. Like, Fuck you, buddy. You're sleeping <laughs> on the couch. Um, yeah. But he, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you've seen, uh, he did a movie called My Left Foot. Hmm. which was fucking incredible. And I'm, I, I can't remember what he had, what his disability was, hmm. but essentially he like only had the use of his left foot. Hmm. And he's like painting with his left foot. 
Wow. And he fucking does it in the movie. Like you watch it and you're like, oh my gosh. Yeah. You're like, this dude is fucking talented and committed. Yeah. And it seems like, so the roles that we just talked about, very different. I mean, because I see a lot of actors and they play a lot of similar roles. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you see Jason Statham, Mm -hmm. he's pretty much going to be the same guy. Yeah. Right. But Daniel Day Lewis, we've talked about a few different, I mean, crazy different roles. That's that versatility is must be tough. It is. And I think, you know, because you want it to be natural. So like you, you fit the roles you've played very yeah. well, though. I mean, the most recent ones, the kids, I, I'm not sure about, but you want it to be like pretty close to who you are. Yeah. And that makes it easier, I would guess. Yeah. You want to find, you know, it's obviously easier when, when you have some things in common with the character. Um, but then, you know, inevitably you want to try and make each one their own, like make each one different and unique from the next. And I think, you know, something obviously that just happens in the industry is people see you, you know, in a role in a movie and they go, we, you know, we love Max in this role. We Mm -hmm. love him as this character. So we're doing this movie and we think he'd be perfect for it. Yeah. And you kind of get typecast, um, you know, and, and it's hard it's hard to get the opportunity to prove that you can do something that's very different from what you're currently doing or what you've done. And when you're given that opportunity, you got to give it everything you have and you got to show people that you can do something totally different. Right. You know, like even like Brad Pitt, right? Like I, for me, I love Brad Pitt's career. Like he's had an awesome career. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I like, I think his roles and, and the movies he's been in have been, fucking cool like you look at um you know even like troy and snatch and fight club and all these movies uh legends of the fall like he's he's always the dude he's always like the stud um once upon a time in hollywood yeah yeah still even old still a stud yeah and and they're all pretty different but you know i think unlike daniel day lewis where you watch a movie and like Daniel Day Lewis isn't there anymore. You always sort of see Brad Pitt. Yeah. Like he's always still yeah. sort of there. You know, I, I think, um, I think Johnny Depp also has had a tremendous career. I think he's, uh, he really gets into a lot of his characters. You know, mm-hmm. if you watch, you know, I mean, like Edward Scissorhands and, yeah. And, you know, they're always a little off the rails and kooky. Pirates of the Caribbean. Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, but they're great. Yeah. I think his greatest performance was Scream. Or was it Scream? Or no, Friday the 13th? Friday the 13th. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I think, wasn't it Tanner? Was that it? I don't know. Oh. I, think it I think it was. I think it was Friday the 13th. I think we were just watching it the other day. Maybe it wasn't. It, it was Taryn that we were looking at. And I think with that Freddy, was, With Freddy Krueger? I think so. I think so. With the original Friday the 13th. Yeah. But uh, I worked with, actually, I worked with, uh, or no, Night, Nightmare on Elm, not on Elm Street, I thought. What is it? Or was it Friday the 13th? I don't know. It was one of those. But I remember seeing him young. I worked with, um, I was fortunate to work with Wes Craven, who was yeah genius director um, who did Nightmare on Elm Street right. and, and Scream. And, you know, he wrote, came up with Nightmare on Elm Street. And uh, I remember when I worked with him, you know, I'd always seen his name and his name even sounds creepy. Yeah, it does. Wes Craven. <laughs> That's a badass name. Yeah. And so, you know, I remember going to meet him for the first time and I'm looking at him. I'm like, That's Wes Craven. Hmm. And uh, and he joked and he said to me, I was like, Hi, Wes. He's like, Oh, no, no, no. He's like, I'm not Wes. He's like, We keep him in the back. We don't let him out. <laughs> and and I laughed and. The alter ego. Yeah. And I quickly realized that Wes, uh, he was really just a very sweet, simple, kind, Hmm. gentle, um, and incredibly, incredibly smart man. Like that you would see and you'd look at him like, this guy could be my grandpa. Hmm. He's just like a sweet, great dude. And, you know, it was, he was kind of quirky and quiet, you know, every day on set, he would do the New York times crossword and like, you know, seven seconds. Like (laughs) he's a genius. He was like, he was a professor at Johns Hopkins. Um, so obviously smart, you know, he told me he came up with Nightmare on Elm Street. He had the idea for this character in the shower. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Wes, I'm like, I wouldn't want to take a shower after that. Like, <laughs> if I, could, I wouldn't bathe ever again if those are the, yeah. the ideas you're having in the shower. <clears throat> and he read this 
article about a kid who was afraid to go to sleep because he thought he would die if he went to bed. Mm. And this kid freaked himself out so bad that he stayed up and he forced himself to stay awake and he wouldn't go to sleep and he forced himself to stay awake for like, like a week or a mm. couple of weeks. And then ultimately his parents went into his bedroom and found him dead. Whoa. And I think it was, you know, he had stressed his body out so bad yeah. or whatever. Um, and Wes saw that and was like, had this, you know, that was all he needed mm -hmm. to give him this idea of like, well, what happens if the guy in your dream comes and you kills you and then you die? Right. Like, you know, and, and now um, it's a franchise. Yeah. And now it's like <laughs> one of the biggest, you know, horror genre, Freddy Krueger icon of, of all time. But, yeah. But Wes Craven was a, yeah, he was a, sadly he passed away at a, a, a brain cancer a few years back and, uh, but he was just a, a lovely, lovely human, just mm. a great dude. Yeah. So you had a cool name. Yeah. Definitely. How about, have you ever met Tarantino? I have not met Tarantino. Um, he seems a little quirky. He seems quirky and I like his movies. Dude, he's, yeah, he does some crazy, mm -hmm. bizarre shit. And there usually a lot of blood. He loves but, blood. But his I, use of I blood. Do, I do love, I mean, he's one of my favorite directors. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I love all his movies, it seemed like. Dude, they're, and they're intense. His movies are intense. Yeah. Like, you know, like Django is like, man, like you feel uncomfortable the entire mm -hmm. movie and it's fucking intense. Oh, yeah, great movie. I mean, but yeah, you're right. It is like, it makes you cringe sometimes when you're watching it because it's so, the, what they're doing, they're saying is so painful. Yeah. But yeah. But it's, it's raw. And I think that's what's good. Storytelling. It's storytelling. Like storytelling, man. It makes you feel. Yeah. Which is, Definitely, you know, you're uh, you're affected when the movie's over, and so I think like, you know, that's one of the important things. It's like you want to leave either you want to leave being affected in some way emotionally, you know, feeling warmer, happier, you know, uh, you know, laughing your ass off. Like mm -hmm. you want to just you, you want to come away with something, take something away. Speaking of feeling, so who's been the biggest celebrity crush of your career? I, I would imagine being a young actor. Like you had some actresses, you're like, oh man, she's beautiful. Biggest celebrity crush. Um, I feel like, unfortunately, it's usually just a letdown. <laughs> I feel, okay, like, so I feel like it's hard because you put everybody on this pedestal, pedestal yeah. and then you have this idea of who they are and, uh, and you meet them and you're like, oh, <laughs> yeah, she looked better in the movie. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's what everybody says about me, though, too. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, biggest crush. I don't know. I, You know, I started acting so early, but I also, I've, my wife and I have been together since we were 16, so <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't I, I didn't ever really have the crazy... 16? 16. Did you guys go to school together? We went to different high schools. Oh. Um, she went to an all-girls school in town, and we we met on vacation in the Caribbean. Mm. Um, and happen to live like 30 minutes apart. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've been together for that's random. 19 years. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. That's a long run. It's a long run. And so, you know, I didn't have a lot of dating time before then just due to my, All right. my so, age, but you know, I've, I've worked certainly. Yeah. Name who you were. I've worked with. with a lot of young actresses who people definitely see as being, um, you know, like those, young hot celebrity icons you know i uh i worked with uh the first actress i worked with was kristen stewart mm -hmm. i worked with kristen on catch that kid and then i worked with um emma roberts um i worked with um olivia cook who's now who was in um she was in the the spielberg video game movie I can't remember what it's called right now. Ready Player One. Mm. Um, I haven't seen that one. She's in the new uh, Game of Thrones as well, House mm. of Dragon. Um, she's lovely. Um, you know, Brittany Snow was my sister in The Pacifier. Um, sweet, beautiful girl, you know. What else has she nice. been in? I can't remember that, her name. She was in Pitch Perfect. Mm. Um, oh, Yeah. And uh, I actually like that movie for some weird reason. I know the, fir the first one. I know the first one's pretty good. Yeah, I think because it's it's unassuming. You're singing. not sure. I, I love co good singing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So yeah, you're not sure, and and there, and it has the right amount of comedy. Yeah. Um, 
I worked with, uh, I worked with Jennifer Lawrence. Um, she's probably the biggest name actress that, you know, people look at as that starlet. Mm -hmm. Um, she seems a little like unhinged. It seems like her role in Silver Linings Playbook was maybe too close to how she is. <laughs> she's she's so quirky. She's hot but crazy. She's she's from Kentucky. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, strong, opinionated, loud. <laughs> um, but we had a lot of fun though. She yeah, was honestly great to work with. Um, just like a fun, fun personality. And, you know, like, again, one of those people that can, you know, even though she's obviously incredibly talented, she can separate characters from, uh, from real life on set. So she mm -hmm. can kind of, you can be there on set and still have fun and be joking and have a great time. And then she can kind of just turn it on. Yeah. She's um, a pro. She's a pro. Yeah. She, uh, probably one of the most natural, um, and the gifted, you know, naturally talented actors I've worked with. Hmm. Um, just like raw sort of had the thing. Right. The uh, it factor. Yeah. Yeah. She seems like it. Um, and I think too, like, you know, I think what people really responded to with her, especially in the beginning of her career was that she, you know, she, she didn't really filter herself mm -hmm. and she, you know, if you look back at like old interviews and really when she was starting, she was, she would say shit that, you know, other people might hold back in, mm. but she was like, this is who I am. Fuck it. You know, <laughs> but good. what you see is what you get, which yeah. I think is great. It's a really nice quality to have. And it's yeah. nice. You know, I think people, it was refreshing for people to feel like, you know, what they saw was what they got. Mm -hmm. um, and I try and, I try and, you know, maintain that attitude is like, yeah, that's a like good approach. this is, this is me. I'm not gonna, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna, you know, sugarcoat anything. I'm not going to bullshit you. Like, you know where we stand. I'm going to leave it. Yeah. I'm just like upfront, honest and you know, I'm a, I'm a simple dude and, and this is who I am. But, uh, okay, well, I'm going to pick then I say Kristen Stewart out of them. Kristen Stewart. Yeah. She's got like that. <clears throat> I don't know. Eyes are a little different. Pretty. Yeah out of those that you mentioned. Yeah. Jennifer Lawrence is up there. Cause of course I'm a big Katniss fan. Yeah. But with the um, bow got to, <laughs> but yeah. Um, so you I said, texted her actually right when that movie came out and gave her a bunch of shit about how she was shooting the bow. Really? Like, yeah. <laughs> and, and in the beginning I was just like, kind of, I was just, I was just pushing her a little mm -hmm. bit. So we have a, you know, an archery instructor. Yeah, I'm like, I'm just yeah. shit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did a review of that movie for GQ. Yeah. And it's like, I, I liked it just because she was a badass in the movie. Yeah. It's, it is awesome. But yeah. yeah, I don't know. I think she had, I think she might have had a Hoyt bow and she had, somebody was coaching her on yeah. it. I know I read that. No, or, she, she did a good job. Yeah, yeah. So you said, but to your point, you said you're a simple guy. I want to, I want to, touch on this that you love hunting mm -hmm. small town you're i don't know you know how accepted it is in hollywood but you hunt a lot yeah and uh what is it have you always hunted yeah i grew up you know my dad my dad didn't hunt didn't fish um you know my dad it's interesting my dad likes the outdoors he likes mm -hmm. being outside but he's not an outdoorsman, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah, you yeah. know, he loves spending time bird work, watching, working outdoors. Or like he loves getting his hands dirty, working oh, okay. on a tractor, working in the vineyard. Oh, I like, got you. Yeah, that's fine. You know, he can do all that stuff. He, you know, is very handy. Um, but he's like, my dad has no patience for anything, mm. and so to sit anywhere and yeah. wait for anything, yeah. forget it. And so fishing, hunting, you know like playing golf, he like any of those things slow. Yeah. yeah fucking d out bored, gone. So yeah, he's like a little, he's a little, uh, he's like a hummingbird. Yeah. You know, um, he's active. and so, you know, my mom is from, my mom was born in Iowa, raised in Minnesota. And so, you know, I grew up around it out there, all my mm. cousins, my grandpa, um, you know, out, out there in the Midwest, you know, uh, opening weekend of deer season is a holiday. Yeah. They yeah. Take off school. It's important. Um, and for me as a kid, I just, I always loved being outside and I was, I was obsessed with nature and wildlife and how everything worked. Hmm. And, you know, I had a, uh, a neighbor right down the road from me, a Native American guy, um, 
who was, I can't remember if he was like, uh, what, what tribe he was part of, but he was, he was half black and half native American, hmm. this guy, George. And he was, he built his bows like out of scratch, hmm. you know, hunted traditionally mm -hmm. and, you know, had written some articles in the paper and stuff. And, um, he would hunt wild boar and turkeys mostly. Was he like a local legend back there yeah. because of all that? Yeah. Yeah. And it was, and he lived right, he lived a few houses down, which is, you know, out in the country, it's like a, you know, half a mile yeah, down the road. Yeah. You know what I love about that is in the same type of situation where hunters back for us were revered and looked up to. Mm -hmm. If you were a good hunter, that's who people wanted to be. Yeah. You know, and that's what's great about an environment or a small town like that is like hunters are, you know, yeah, they, they're looked up to. And so it sounds like he was. Totally. Yeah. It was because, you know, you, I looked at this guy and thought, man, like he's like really connected to the land. Mm -hmm. This guy is really, he understands it all. Like he's, he's, he's taking everything in. He's looking around and right. really, really taking in the world. And, um, you know, being a kid who was super inquisitive, like I would go down there and talk to him mm -hmm. and, uh, he had, um, he had all these, you know, he'd built all these different things out of feathers and had like headdresses and all this really cool shit that I loved. Mm. And, so then I would go down there and start making things with him. You know, he bought me a, a drum and we drummed together. Mm. He bought me a drum that was, I forget what kind of height it was that was stretched over. Um, but we would drum together and uh, I would paint skulls with him. Mm. And uh, and then that sort of, that sort of like sparked it, right? So then instead of being the kid that was collecting toys and stuff in my room, I would go out and find dead animals, mm. whatever. Yeah. And I would... I would get the skull and the bones and bring him back. And so my room as a, as a, you know, eight, nine year old kid was filled with like coyote skulls and bobcat skulls yeah. and raccoon and deer antlers with feathers hanging off of them. And like very sort of tribally, you know, um, just like, I don't it, you know, for most people, they'd look at it and be like, that's weird. <laughs> yeah. You know, why your son is obsessed with death, but <clears throat> it wasn't really that. It was just, mm -hmm. I was obsessed with these animals and understanding them and, you know, and then I got older, um, you know, I, I got my first, uh, my first shotgun when I was nine. Um, before that, you know, I had a BB gun I'd run around the yard with. And my mom being from the Midwest, her rule was always like, if you kill it, you eat it. Mm -hmm. And that was what she always told me. And so I said, okay. And, you know, so here I was running around our property, shooting and stuff, shooting Robins yeah. and Blue Jays and everything. And you know, I think she thought that like, well, this will, this will make him be responsible, but we'll probably deter him from like killing the neighborhood yeah. bird population. Right. But no, like instead I'd kill him. I'd bring him in, <laughs> breast him out and, really? cook, and cook him right there in like the kitchen. Like a robin? Oh yeah. Robins are actually great. Really? Yeah. Okay. I've never. <clears throat> so I'd be sitting there cooking like robins and stuff. And she's like, you know, she's like, well, I told him if he, you know, <laughs> you really got to eat it. So she's like, you know, she kind of had to had to uh, eat her words there a little bit, but I guess they're about the same size as a dove, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. About the same size. I know a lot of the Italians in the area I grew up in, they used to make them with polenta. Mm. It was like a thing. Really? Mm -hmm. I, and, that reminds me, I was like, I had, I remember we killed a pheasant when I was a kid, maybe grade school, like maybe third grade. And I took the foot of the pheasant and I, I like had a long sleeve shirt or jacket. And then I had my hand pulled in and it was holding. And I went to school with like, the pheasant claw basically <laughs> and so i get what you're saying and then another time i brought i found this big hornet's nest and it was in the winter and i brought it in my room i'm like oh sweet this hornet nest like badass big fucking paper thing and then it got warm in my room and then the hornets kind of woke up because oh, they were just in there, I guess, for the winter. I didn't know anything about this. And I had hornets all over my room because it got warm and they woke up. <laughs> so, yeah, I get that my my room, too, like yours, the dead animals in different parts. And But I think that's you learn you learn real quick about the that connection to the land and what it, what it means. And totally the the pluses and minuses of it. Yeah, no, exactly. You know, and as I got as I got older, I just, I learned more and, you know, I, I got my, my hunting license when I was 10. Um, and again, so my dad didn't go, I, you know, found people that would take me. Mm -hmm. Did that George take you? I, so I never actually got to hunt with George. George, uh, George passed away, 
uh, unfortunately he, he got, he got cancer and passed away. And I remember it was a pretty emotional thing. And I really like looked up to this guy and, uh, he, he had a teepee in his backyard and I remember his wife lighting this fire in the teepee and then everybody going over and putting wood on the fire mm. and continuously, you know, the neighbors would come over and bring like a piece of wood to put on the fire. And I'm, I'm probably botching like the, the meaning behind it all. But I, th I think it has to do with, you know, setting his spirit, you know, mm -hmm. sort of free and, um, but it was like a pretty intense and emotional thing. Cause it was about keeping this fire going for a certain mm -hmm. amount of time. Mm. Um, but just a great, just sweet, quiet guy and just mm -hmm. a great dude. Um, How old were you when he died? I was in my teens. Mm. Um, yeah. And we had, uh, we had, we had always talked about he was going to take me wild boar hunting with a mm. traditional bow. Mm. Um, but you know, I've, I've been fortunate to have a lot of people like that who I've learned a lot from, you know, and not just about how to be, you know, a better hunter, a better fisherman, a better outdoorsman, but like, you know, from a, from a, a tactical level, you know, from, but from a, like a respect and emotional level as well, like how to just be, you know, a better sort of steward of the land, um, and how to find appreciation for all of it and, you know, and, and understand all of it. Um, and to me, that's like one of the biggest things, you know, I think, uh, you know, it's, there's something about being in the outdoors and, you know, certainly in today's day and age where like, you don't really know where your food's coming from. Um, but like harvesting, you know, and I still, like I'll raise animals too, like on my property, mm -hmm. like I'll raise pigs and, you know, um, raise, uh, you know, like a, a beef cow, you know, every once in a while and stuff like that. And like, I, I like the responsibility of harvesting my meat and like understanding where it comes from. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I have a greater respect for what I'm, for what I'm putting in my body and I'm not disconnected from that thing. And I think it's hard for some people emotionally. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it's, it's life and you know, it comes from somewhere. Right. And, uh, you know, and a big part of it for me too is, is, you know, hunting wise is not necessarily, you know, obviously every hunter wants to be successful. Mm -hmm. Um, that's like, you know, the ultimate thing, but you quickly realize because it is hard and, you know, and it can be very, very challenging. You quickly realize that the experience is really, uh, is really, is really what makes it what it is. Yeah. It's the time, you know, with people, you know, who also have this same feeling and same appreciation and being in the outdoors and really being in wild and remote and rugged places and experiencing these things that you don't experience anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And man, it's, like I said, it's, it's, it's hard to explain to somebody if they haven't done it. Right. And when the thing that I love, and I'm sure that you've done it, plenty of times is when you take someone for the first time mm -hmm. and you see them like, and you see their mind and just kind of like explode. Yeah. And you see that realization of them going like, fuck, this is not only way harder than I imagined, but just being out here is kind of incredible. Yeah. And this experience is something that I didn't imagine it was going to be like, you know, and I even like, it's funny, like even, even duck hunting, you know, is one of those things where I feel like when you explain it to somebody, it's like, so you just go and you walk out of a pond and you sit there in the water and then you shoot ducks when they come in. Mm -hmm. I'm like, in simple form, yes. Mm -hmm. But when you do it, it's a totally different sort of outdoor wild experience than, than you can actually describe to somebody. Like when you go and you, and you walk out there in the dark and you hear the wings of all these, you know, migratory, you know, waterfowl flying over, you know, and you hear the different calls they're making Yeah, and you sit there and you watch, you know, the sun come up over the Sutter Buttes and the sun rising and you see the, the fog, you know, on the water, the Thule fog lifting mm -hmm. and, and all of a sudden the marsh comes to life. Right. 
It's like that to me is what makes it so magical. Like right. I could sit there and not pull the trigger all day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and at 1030, my wife's texting me and be like, the ducks, I know the ducks aren't <laughs> flying anymore. Yeah. When are you coming back in? Right. But there's something really peaceful and just, I don't know, that I love about being out there. And so it's really the combination of all those things that I love about, you know, being someone who eats meat um, and, and, you know, of every form, you know. Um, and, you know, and I also like will forage, like I'll go, you know, go mushroom hunting mm -hmm. and do all, like I love to, you know, for me sort of the ultimate is if you can make like, you know, you put together like a surf and turf. Yeah with you know wild mushrooms and shit off the land right. like that's the greatest you yeah. know you make this meal that's like you've gathered that we've been doing as you know as humans for fucking hundreds of thousands of years like, yeah that's like the ultimate right exactly I, I think people who don't know they it's very simplified it's the the version is simplified you go out you see a deer you shoot it you go out you know hide in a blind and shoot a duck it's like yeah i mean i guess the basics are there, but you're missing so much. Mm -hmm. It's so, there's so many layers to it. There's so much to learn. There's so much to be part of, to appreciate, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, that's what it is. It's appreciate, appreciating all life, what's going on. And I think that's a, a big reason why hunters respect life so much more than maybe an anti-hunter would who's never killed mm -hmm. because we, we know what's at stake. Mm -hmm. As a hunter, we know what's at stake. We're killing something and that means something. Or even if we're not killing something, we're seeing life, you yeah. know, in its greatest form out there living. And, uh, you know, unless you're in it, how would you know? But, uh, yeah, I mean, you wish you could spend the day, a day out there with everyone. Yeah. You know, because then they would, it's almost like you're pulling the curtain back and saying, here's what's going on. Mm -hmm. Look how amazing it is. Yeah, experience it. That's the best part of being a hunter. I mean, people see the trophies and the heads and all that. And all that is, is that's just to honor the memories and the animals that, you know, I've killed. So they, they made a sacrifice and, uh, you know, it's just to, to honor them. But, uh, people see, they probably don't understand all that because they are hunters, yeah. but, but with us being hunters and you being so passionate about it, I mean, yesterday we spent a lot of time talking about hunting mm -hmm. as we were doing our lift run shoot, but you're showing me videos of these bucks you have coming in to your, uh, clover. And yeah, I mean, that's just, you can tell that's what you love, mm -hmm. you know, or, or one of the things you love. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you love many things, but hunting is such a, it's who we are, yeah. you know, it's who it's all man has that connection somewhere, but we're just still doing it. And it's like, totally. Yeah. A lot of people have just kind of disconnected and become further from it. And yeah, you know, and I think also like, I'm, 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 I'm super thankful for, for you and, you know, a lot of other folks as well in this, you know, in, in the hunting and outdoor community who have been able to try and help bridge that gap and have people understand. And I think, you know, I think we're at a time now too where people are starting to question more what they put in their body from a health standpoint mm -hmm. and, um, you know, uh, and the protein and, you know, the, the stuff, you know, not having hormones in it and, and all these things. Right. And, and I think one, it's like from a, from a, a green standpoint, like there's nothing more green and, um, you know, pure, pure than, than, than wild meat. Yeah. And, you know, certainly through bow hunting, I think people are starting to, people are starting to have more of an appreciation for it and understanding and acceptance. Mm -hmm. And it really is because of people like you opening their eyes and, and trying to show them, you know, what it really is. Yeah. Um, you know, and people are really, you know, becoming more and more about sustainability and, um, you know, uh, living off the land and there's, there's, you know, things are trending that way. Mm -hmm. And so I think people are starting to open their eyes to, to, to bow hunting. And, you know, my hope is that more people will, will learn about it. And, um, you know, I mean, like anything, not everything is for everyone. Uh, they they and, might not do it, but do they understand yeah, it? I mean, it's no, it's no different than you said, you know, the work that you're doing, you know, you mentioned me with bow hunting and other others also, but it's no different than the work you're doing on your TV shows to humanize 
the military to humanize the firefighters. So we're humanizing hunters. Mm -hmm. And not all hunters are just drunk rednecks out there driving around shooting shit out of the yeah. truck. You know, there's some people who this is their, they dedicate their lives to being yeah. the very best they can be at. To me, it's bow hunting. And so, yeah, you, you tell that story, you hum, humanize it, you explain it a little more. You, you know, as I said, pull back the curtains and you, people are like, okay, I think I get it a little more. I yeah. think I understand what you're saying. I'm not going to do it, but I understand. Yeah. And so that's what we're doing with discussions like this and you sharing, you know, being, you know, part of Hollywood mm -hmm. and you share your passion for the hunt that helps bridge that gap also. Yeah. And, you know, we're not, we're not expecting everybody to go out there and kill a deer, Yeah. but just understand why we do it and the benefits to it and how it affects, you know, the conservation of habitat and all the other animals that share that habitat. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, once you look at it like that, you're like, okay, I can, I understand now. I can, now. I can I deal it. with that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, I think it's like with anything, right. People want to find like, and there's going to be, there's, there's, you have bad seeds and everything, right. Mm -hmm. There's going to be like, you look at any, anything, and there's going to be negative people associated or things that maybe are done the wrong way, whatever. And that that's across anything. Yeah. I don't care what it is. Definitely. Um, but I think it's like, again, it's like going back to, you know, but I, I think instead of focusing on that, like maybe look at the positive side and look at the, the positive things that people are doing. And, you know, going back to what I tell Bo, it's like focus on the stuff that's maybe helpful, not yeah, hurtful. Exactly. And yeah. And you'll see things a little differently. I mean, if you want to, if you want to look at things negatively your whole life, you're only going to see things negative. Yeah, and you're not going to have a very fulfilling life. No, and it's hard to. It's just like you know, you got to have an open mind. Mm -hmm. with, and I think that's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure we're all guilty of it at some point. But you know, being close-minded to things, but it's, uh, it's important to always remind yourself to, you know, try and have an open mind, and understand things better, and you know, find ways to be helpful. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's a pretty pretty amazing experience once you understand it and you do it. Yeah, I agree. Well, how I always end the podcast because what I'd say is I I come and I like to have discussions with outliers. I feel like I'm the the average guy who have somehow have access to stars like you. And so speaking for average people, I'm like, okay, this is outliers. Here's their story. Here's how I can, you know, help tell that story to people just like me. Well, how I end it is giving a brand new bow to that my guest of the week, an outlier, and that's you. Oh man, this week, dude. So, Max, here's your uh, here's the bow that you set the record with yesterday. How about that? Thank you. So brother. you're taking that home, dude. And I I'm so appreciative. Um, <laughs> I seriously cannot wait to to get out there and, and, and fling some more arrows with this thing, but also just, you shot it so well yesterday, just to have respect for what this thing means and you know, what it's capable of. And, um, you know, it's, it's, a uh, it's a lot of fun, but you know, there's a lot of responsibility and, um, I don't know. I mean, obviously I, I can't ask to have uh, <laughs> a greater bow hunting and just, you know, all out legend of, uh, folks who, who, who use and understand these things than you to give me one. So oh. I'm, I'm, I will, I will cherish this thing. And, um, man, I, uh, you know, I can't wait, can't wait to teach my boy, my boys, um, how to shoot a bow yeah. and, and get them into it. Well, I, I, I have all the faith in the world. They're going to be great hunters just like you. And, uh, that bow is, that's a great bow. The old Ventum pro. I like those long axle to axle bows. That's 33 inches there. But yesterday, 143 yards you were freaking dialed in and it was awesome to watch i mean i'm so thankful max that you came again you did the lift run shoot with me um you shot the bow so well i'm just i'm i really appreciate just what you stand for and who you are and that the fact that we've become friends so thank you for coming no thank you man i really appreciate you having me and honestly just the whole experience you are a uh you're a badass dude you're a beast i mean every every more than I expected, honestly. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled, and I'm gonna go have to go home and get my ass running a bit more. But uh, I can't yeah. wait to come back and and do it again and shoot some more arrows and hopefully sooner and later hit the mountain together. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, and spend some time out there in the great outdoors. Uh, you did great. Thank you again. And uh, thanks for listening to all the people tuning in. And thanks for your time, Max. Drive safe, heading home. Keep hammering. Thanks, brother. All right. Every step I take, I move my truth. Every time they tell me stop, I use. Every comment, hate that makes my feel. Gather up my energy and boom. I hear them talking, saying the way that I move is so reckless. That is a part of my mind I've been blessed with. Giving my blood so I am relentless. My fault. They want someone to blame. They sent their hate. It fuels my pace. I am Roy Tough. I am the change, the fuel, endure. Feeling like Cam Haynes.